All right, class, we are beginning chapter four, and this is about derivatives. And we're going to take a long look at how derivatives affect graphs. And so 4.1 is just about minimum and maximum, or maximum and minimum values in graphs. That's what we're going to look at first uh, for that. And let's go with it. So, of course, got a little theorem for you. It's called the extreme value theorem. All right, again, just the introduction here. So here it is. If you have a function called f, and it is continuous, which means no breaks in the graph, and it is also on a closed interval from a to b, f continuous, have to draw it out, starting at a, ending at b, along the x axis, you can go up or down as much as you like, then f has to have, f contains or attains an absolute maximum value and an absolute minimum value. There is no other way around it. And this could be important pretty much through the rest of the chapter and culminates in 4.7. So here's what I'm going to do. Let you guys uh, copy that down. If you need to pause the video at any one point, that's fine too. I'm going to go ahead and do a little visual of it here. So here it is. I have a graph. Starts at, let's just say, starts at A, which is the left side of my graph. Ends at B. Um, there has to be some time in this process. There has to be a maximum value. There has to be a minimum value. There is no other way around it. Now, it could happen in the middle of the graph. It could also happen possibly at the end of the graph or beginning of the graph. So notice on this one here, yeah, it's the end value that is the maximum. Or sorry, the begin value is the maximum. And then somewhere along the lines, we got a minimum value. So it could happen inside the interval. It could happen at the end of the interval. But if you have a, a line or a curve that you draw with your pencil or pen without lifting, and you start at one end, you start at and you end at another, you will somewhere along the line have a maximum and a minimum. Okay, so now the question is this. What happens if it's not continuous? What happens if I get to break this graph somewhere? So graphs that are not continuous cannot follow this rule, because once I can lift my pencil or pen off the sheet of paper, I can begin anywhere I want. So just a quick example here. Here it is. This one. <clears throat> there it is. I start here, and I just go up. And remember, closed dots means I am at that point. Open dots mean I never reach that point. I get super, super close to it, but I never reach that point. So right here, and then right here. So notice... This one, particularly, look at this. This one actually does have a minimum, is that right? Minimum is this little value right here, the bottom. So there's a minimum, but no maximum. Okay, your job. Can you draw for me a graph? Oh, let me give you some conditions here. It's going to end at 2. I'm going to have a graph. I'm going to have it have a vertical asymptote of 2. So all yours, can you graph for me a graph that has a minimum but no maximum. All right, so there it is. So it happens on non-continuous graphs. This is mine. Yours can be a little different. <clears throat> that also happens on graphs that may go off to infinity. So there's your two different possibilities. Now this one, this one, the reason it violates the extreme value theorem here is there's no over, there's no interval that it stops at, right? There's no closed interval because this thing goes on forever. Okay, so let's do in two parts. Next part is in two parts here. First of all, what happens to derivatives and their graphs? So here's the first part, is whenever you have a derivative, I'll let you copy it down here, derivatives and graphs, part one. And these are all the values that 
f prime of x will equal zero. Right? So these are important because there's going to be two different kinds that we're going to deal with. So if you have a derivative that is actually going to equal zero, what you have is you have something called a critical point, sometimes called a stationary point, sometimes called a critical number. There it is. There's three different ways to say it. They're stating the same thing. So critical point, stationary point, or critical number. But for these graphs here, here it is. I can have a graph that hits a zero about right there. That will give you a maximum. On the second graph, notice it goes down, 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 down. And it starts turning back up. So then you have a minimum somewhere over here where you have a slope of zero. And then you have the two plateaus. So it can be go down, down, down. And then just for a split second, right inside this little middle section here, the slope hits a zero. Not going up, not going down anywhere. And then it starts going, still continuing to go back down. And then the other way you can have a plateau, you can be, it be coming up, hits a zero, even though this does not look like it hits a zero slope, but it does, let's pretend. And then it goes back up. So there it is. So if you have a zero slope or a derivative that equals zero, you have one of these four <clears throat> possibilities. OK, next. Part two. So what happens here? All right, what happens here is that the derivative doesn't exist. That's what's happening here. So derivatives and graphs part two is you have, and I kind of graph these kind of the same here. This is called a cusp, C-U-S-P. And what happens here is on the left-hand side, the slope goes to positive infinity just for a split second, then it jumps to negative infinity. So it goes to infinite value right at a certain place. And then the exact opposite here goes to negative infinity, all of a sudden skips into a positive infinity. So that's a cusp. Derivative goes to infinity. You could also just have a corner. So this is a slope of negative three coming down and all of a sudden it, boom, it jumps up to a positive three afterwards. And that's another possibility. And that's okay. Just have yourself a corner. All right, and this one again, another interesting one, it goes up, and then just for a split second, the slope goes off to infinity, and then it curves back together. Same here, this slopes down to negative infinity just for a split second, and then turns back up. So what is this called? So all of these, we say f of x has a critical point or critical number. So f of x is not differentiable at this point. So something's happened here that I can't take the derivative of it. I just crossed it out just so it didn't look like an or, so I put the or here. So on our previous slide, we see these are also critical points, right? Critical points, critical number, yep, same stuff here, same vocabulary, except the only ones that we did not mention is stationary. So stationary points are the only times where the derivative will be actually equal to zero. All right, I'm going to write all that down. And if we're done, let's go on to the next one. So let me give you the two definitions. There it is, definition one. A critical number of a function f is a number c in its domain where the function such that either one is true, either the derivative at c is equal to zero or the derivative does not exist. That is called a critical number or a critical point. Definition for a stationary point of a function f is a number c in the domain of f such that the derivative at c is zero. So if you say stationary point, it means I know that you're saying derivative is exactly zero somewhere. If you say critical point or critical number, then I'm thinking either the derivative does not exist or it's equal to zero. 
All right, so let's try. Let's try these few problems here that we have before us. All right, so with the extreme value theorem, we have this. It's called the closed interval method. So this is a way I can find the maximum or I can find the minimum value. So first is the requirement, requirement that f is continuous on a through b. Basically fulfills the extreme value theorem. All right, so how do we find them? That's one thing to know that they exist, but how do you find them? So we're gonna find the critical numbers of f. So we're gonna find points where maybe there's zero, the derivative is zero or it does not exist. In an interval, a, b, notice it's an open interval, right? So somewhere in there. We're also going to find their values. So again, all this is just to figure out, hey, what's the maximum here? What's the minimum here? That's all I want to know. All right. And then what we're going to do, once we do that, we're going to find the values at the endpoints to see if the endpoints were higher or lower than any of the points we found. And then we're just going to let the maximum be the largest from steps one and two. And then we're going to find minimum to be the smallest from steps one and two. <clears throat> All right. So. Before we go for it, I just want to be able to us, for us to understand this whole concept of the absolute. Minimums and maximums here. So part of the homework assignment for you is to actually sketch a graph with certain conditions. And so there's something called absolute minimums, which means it's the, it's the very, very bottom of the graph then absolute minute maximums would be the very top of the graph. And then we have something called the local maximums. Well, local maximums are gonna be our little hills. So it is a maximum, yes, but it's only a maximum for a certain amount of time or a certain place. And of course, obviously local minimum will also be the same. So can you sketch for me a graph? I'm gonna begin at one to five. And at one, I want you to make this graph to be an absolute minimum. At five, I want this to have an absolute maximum. Then at two, I want it to be a local maximum or a local minimum. So I'll give you guys a whole 15 seconds. Can you graph the graph that just has these conditions? All right, I'm going to try it myself here as well. So there it is. Went from one, two, three, four, five this way. I'm going to go. Okay, that's going to be on my maximum right here. That one is going to be my minimum. And then somehow between the two, I at two, I'm going to have to have a local max. So it's a little bit high, but not too high. Not above my absolute max. And then I need a low value, but not below my absolute minimum. So about right there. So can you make a little graph connecting those points? So yeah, that looks pretty good right there. All right, another one. Let me show you another one. Again, yours doesn't have to be the same as mine. Yours can be different. Let me show you one that's going to be quite a bit different here. One, two, three, four, five. So again, minimum goes like this, goes there, and there should be a maximum. And then you know what? Let me do it like this. Let me get a little creative, and I'm going to put a little cusp in here. And then I'm going to make a little polynomial right here. There it is. So I have a little cusp at two. It gets me a, a local maximum, right? That's kind of cool. Okay, so let's get on with the task before us. So here it is. Our job is to find absolute minimums, absolute maximums. That's it. Exercise to sketch the graph of the function f by hand and use your sketch to find the absolute and local maximum and minimum values of f. Now, I don't
don't want you to sketch it by hand. Uh, I'm gonna just say this, it's a good idea for these just for you to look to see how they look like as a graph after you're done. I want you to do the work first and then take a look at the graph and see if your answers correspond. All right, let's try this together here. So f of x is x cubed. Now this graph, I think you probably should know pretty well already. So x cubed. I'm going to go from negative 1 to 2. So that's all I need of this graph. And I also know, right, x cubed goes like this. It starts low and ends high, goes through 0, 0. All right, so then the condition says I'm going to go from negative 1. I'm going to go to positive 2. But I'm not including negative 1 as my x value. So here's what we do. We know that if you were to plug in a negative 1 into here, into x cubed, negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 is going to give you negative 1 right there. But we're not including negative 1 in our problem, so we're going to have to go to an open dot. And that's pretty much the definition of open dot. You're not including the endpoint. All right, then we're going to go to 2. So if you plug in 2 into x cubed, 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8 is about right there. Or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There, there we go. Oops, miscounted. There it is. And then my graph's going to go like this. So question is, do I have a absolute, you know, oh, it also says this, find the absolute and local maximum of these. Wow, everything here. Okay, so I'm thinking there's an absolute maximum there. Uh, there's also no absolute or local minimum. So let's see if this makes sense here. There are no absolute, because there's no very bottom of this graph. There's no local minimums either. There's never a time where it sort of changes right direction from going down to going up. All right. There's no local maximum either. The only thing that we have is we have an absolute maximum of eight, which is the value at two. So that's one way to say it. We say absolute maximum of eight at two. Another way you can say it is like this. You can say absolute maximum, and then we do some notation. We say of two is eight, and that tells you the exact same thing. Okay, let's see if that makes sense. Ask questions of the other people in the class if you have some questions about it. All right, if not, let's go on. Yeah. Three, find the absolute maximum, absolute minimum values. Okay, so now this one, yes, this one actually meets the condition of the extreme value theorem. So then I know now, I know that I'm going to find, I'm including negative one, I'm including four, so I'm including the endpoints. It's on a closed interval, and I'm including them, so there has to be a local, sorry, absolute maximum, absolute minimum somewhere. Could be the middle, could be on the sides. So let's do this here first. I'm going to take the derivative, because once I take the derivative, instead of equal to 0, I'm going to know all the times that this thing changes direction. And that's all I need. Once I know where my slopes are 0, or when they change direction, that could possibly be a absolute min or absolute max. That's cool, though. So let's do this here. Let's set equal to zero. And anybody know how to do this guy? I think we've got a factor, right? But I think 3, 12, and 9 goes into all of those here. So how about 3? Can go into 3, 12, and 9? Yep, I can factor out a 3 here. It'll give me x squared minus 4x plus 3. And can I factor down some more? Two numbers multiplied to 3 add to negative 4. I got myself. How about an x minus 1x minus 3? So if I set each of those guys equal to 0, I'll eventually end up with x equals 1 and x equals 3. Okay, 
x equals 1 and 3 are those inside the domain that I'm looking for. Absolutely, x equals 1 is inside negative 1 to 4, and 3 is inside negative 1 to 4. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I have to test the endpoints. I also have to test the new values that I got, because this could possibly bring me a little bit lower than the endpoint, and then I got myself an absolute max, or an absolute min. So I've got to test the endpoints. So f of negative 1, I'm going to test this guy. I'm going to test f of positive 1. It's kind of usually good to go in order. And then go f of 3. And then the last one is f of 4. So I'm testing my stationary points or critical numbers. So you see if those fell below the endpoints or the endpoints, the lowest or the highest values here. So you just have to plug it into your calculator. So if someone plug in negative 1 into the calculator, someone else plug in a positive 1, someone else plug in a positive Three and then another person plug in a four into the calculator, or you can do it by hand. That's fine. Just need answers. Pause the video if you need to here. But here's what I got. As I plug in negative one into my original problem, negative one gives me a value of negative 14. So on a graph, at negative 1, this guy went all the way down to negative 14. Okay, at positive 1, plug in positive 1, you get a 6. Plug in a 3, you get a 2. And plug in a 4, you get a 6. So which one of these is the maximum? Actually, I have 2, huh? So here it is. Absolute maximum of 6, that's my value, at... Two different spots, x equals 1 and x equals 4. How about an absolute minimum? Absolute minimum. The value is negative 14 at, you could say x equals negative 1. You could say at negative 1. Both are the same. All right, and then, like I said over here, it's good to graph these just to sort of see what they look like after you're done, and then confirm your answer here. So I'm gonna graph this in Desmos. Yeah, negative 14, like negative one would be down here. So negative 14 is all the way down there. That's cool. And our graph went from Looks like right here, yeah, graph at one, this is a two, so that's one and a half, so that's one. At one, it reached a value of six, and as I go down, and back up right at four, it reaches again the value right at six, and that's my endpoint. So in fact, my somewhere inside my graph was the absolute maximum, tied with the endpoint was an absolute maximum. Okay, just getting to the point, taking derivatives, setting equal to zero, finding critical numbers, and then deciding what's the absolute max, what's the absolute min here. All right, if you want to take the derivative of this guy, go for it. Let us be a little bit ahead of me. If not, then we'll just do it together in just a second here. All right, let's go for it here. So f prime of t. In fact, you know what, before I do that, let me just actually, since I don't want to do product rule here, I'm going to just distribute the cube root of t to the 8. And remember, cube root is the same thing as power to the 1 third, right? If I go over here, oh boy, let's see if this makes sense here. As I multiply the cube, t to the 1 third power, times t to the 1 power, we just add the powers together. So 1 third plus 1 makes 4 thirds. I think I'm ready to take the derivative now. So the derivative of this guy is 8 times the 1 third makes it 8 over 3. t to the 1 third minus 1, right? This is the power rule, right? 1 third minus 1 or 3 over 3 makes negative 2 thirds. Minus, okay, power rule again. 4 thirds goes out in front t to the subtract 1 from that. So 4 thirds minus 1 gives me 1 third. OK, so here's what we got to do. We've got to simplify this. 
So I'm going to just at least get um, negative exponents out of here. So in the first one, negative 2 thirds. So I'm going to keep the 8 on top, 3 on the bottom, put the t on the bottom, and then I can change the sign of my exponent. Minus. Let's see what I have here. Let's see, that's a 4 on top, t to the 1 third on top, and then I have myself a 3. All right, what should I do to get common denominators? I'm going to have to multiply the second parenthesis by t to the 2 thirds and t to the second. Sorry, not second parenthesis, second fraction. Okay, there's that. Voila. I think I got it. So on top, I have an 8 and t, or 8 t to the 2 thirds minus. Now, this one's interesting. This is going to be a 4, and it'll be a 1 third times 2 thirds. Whenever we multiply numbers, we add exponents. So that would be 3 thirds, which is good. Okay. I'm good. Lots of steps here. You'll find out that your algebra skills come way, way good and handy here. All right. I think we're almost done simplifying this out. Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to put it all under the same denominator, which is 3 t to the 2 thirds, and how about 8 minus 14? And you know what I'm going to do also? You don't have to, but it's kind of customary sometimes. I'm going to see if I can factor the top, because 4 and 8 do have something in common called a 4. So if I pull a 4 out of those, I'm left with 2 minus t over the denominator. There it is. That's probably the most simplified answer I can possibly give for that value. And now, oof, now we set it equal to 0. So let's go for it here. So this little guy right here set equal to zero. So I'm going to find out when the derivative is equal to zero. Oh, we've got ourselves a little problem because I think there's a time where this derivative does not exist. So t cannot be equal to zero. t is equal to zero. That means the denominator becomes zero, and then the whole thing all just disappears. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 3t to the 2 thirds. I can do that now, now that I declare that t cannot be equal to 0, right? Because you can only multiply by 0 on both sides of the equation. Those are gone. I'm left with 4 times t minus 2. Again, still to the 0. And then I can drop the 4, kind of dividing the 4 on both sides, still equal to 0. And how about t equals to 2? OK, so I have a we call it a non-differentiable form at t equals 0. And t equals 2 is where the derivative is equal to 0. OK, so with that said, let's go and let's go back to what we need. Oh, we started off at 0. Is that right? 0 through 8. Is that right? So our domain was from 0 to 8. Zero is a time where our, we don't even have a derivative at that time. Okay. Um, let's see. Next is two. We found a point inside our domain, and eight is also my end point. So I'm going to have to test at zero. Oh, I gave it away already here. So if you plug in a zero back to the original function, you should get a zero. If you plug in a two back to the original function, you should get, this one's a little bit of tricky, but go for it. You should get a six cube root of 2. And if you plug an 8 into this function, the original function, you get 0. So again, you got this concept here. You have absolute minimum at two different spots. So the absolute minimum of 0 at t is equal to 0 and t is equal to 8. The endpoints type. Then you have an absolute maximum of 6 cube root of 2 at t equals 2. All right, and again, graph these on your calculator if you like. Graph these on Desmos if you like. Just graph them so you can kind of see the graph itself. And if you want to test it, you can even just check what is 6 times cube root of 2, what is that as a decimal approximation? 
and use the ground right here. All right, so notice, yeah, at x equals zero. Oh, wow, at x equals zero, notice what happens here. Right here, there's a, the derivative goes off to infinity, right? Boom. So why are those called the same? No, they do have a special name for them. It's just when the derivative goes off, or the slope goes to infinity. That's what happens right here. So right at x equals zero, slope goes off to infinity, reaches a high point right here, which is the absolute maximum. And exactly at eight, it's the zero again, which is the same height as this one, which is kind of cool. All right, next one. Again, these are getting a little more difficult. But I think you guys can handle it. This is all good. All right. Give you guys a 30 second head start. See if you want to try it yourself, go for it. All right, so we're going from zero to one only. Okay, so whatever we get, we better check just to make sure it's between zero and one. Because if we get a value of, let's say three, we're like, oh yeah, it does do something at three, but who cares? Because it's gonna decide the domain that we want. All right, so let's go with it here. So f prime of x is, oh, e is the derivative of itself. And then the chain rule says I still have to take the derivative of negative x, which is negative one. So remember chain rule, take the outside function, this says it's e, we'll leave it the same. Take the inside function, which in this case is negative x, so it becomes a negative one. Okay, minus sign. So I got two e to the negative two t, and the derivative of negative two t. Negative two. Oh, cool. All right, for this to happen, how about this negative? Oh, you know what? Let's see. Negative goes out in front. Notice you have a negative in the exponent as well. You have a negative in the exponent. You might as well put it down at the bottom, make it positive. Oh, same thing here. So this becomes a plus because the minus and the negative two, so two on top. E to the negative two x now becomes e to the two x on the denominator in the denominator. All right, next, just like we did last time is, I need to put these guys together. What should I multiply by? Which fraction should I multiply by to get common denominators? And it's gonna be the first fraction. We're gonna multiply both top and bottom by e to the x. Because remember, when you multiply exponents, all you do is multiply them in the number. All you do is add the exponents. So e to the t times e to the t makes e to the 2t. Lots of algebra stuff here we're having here. There it is. There's that. And finally put together makes common denominator right here. And I'm just going to put the 2 in front because we normally in math don't like negatives to be out in front. We just, just can't help them. So how about 2 minus e to the 2? All right, here we go. Let's set this guy equal to zero. So two minus e to the t over e to the two t equals the zero. So the question is, is there ever a time that e to the two x becomes zero? Is there ever a time this guy can become a zero? Is there ever a time the denominator itself could become zero? No, there isn't, huh? Because whatever I plug in even, if I plug in a zero in for the x value, it still be e to the zero, which is still a one, right? So, oh, that's right. So never a time I can break this as a fraction. That's cool, okay. So let's multiply both sides by the common denominator. One side and the other. Those guys cancel, leaves me with this right here. And zero times anything is still zero. Okay, let's move the e to the x to the other side. Still trying to solve this. If you guys remember all the way back in algebra two how to solve this. What we do is we stick in an ln on both sides. So now it becomes ln of two, ln of e to the x. And those ln and e get to cancel each other out right there. Leaving it with ln is equal to x. Oh, the other way of doing it is just to change forms. If 
you guys remember that from always in algebra 2. Changing from 2 equals e to the x. You can change the forms back, and it'll just change it to this right here. It'll get the same exact answer. But usually we do it algebraic. Okay, so question is this. I get an answer of ln of 2. Is that within the domain that I'm looking at? Is that within 0 to 1? So this time you do have to punch into the calculator, punch an ln of 2, and see if that gives you a 1. All right, ln of 2 is approximately 0 0.69, and yep, that is cool. That is inside my domain. Okay, so that means I got to check my endpoints, which is 0 and 1, and also ln of 2. So let's go for it here. So f of 0. Plug in a 0 and back into the original function to see what we get. And you get yourself a that one, that one. And e to the 0 power is 1, and then again, 1, and then 1 minus 1 is 0. So this guy hits a 0, 0. All right, ah, the fun one, ln of 2. Let's plug in ln of 2, and we get ourselves e to the negative ln of 2 plus e to the negative 2 times ln of 2. Whoa, okay. How's this going to work? Let's see. So first things first, anything that's outside of my log function, I can bring as an exponent in front. So this would be e to the ln of 2 to the negative 1, that little. So multipliers in front of ln becomes powers to the number inside ln. Same thing here. So numbers, negative 2. Front of ln becomes powers to the number inside ln. And then if you remember, from algebra, when you have this, oh, let's simplify this down. So 2 to the negative 1 is really a 1 half. 2 to the negative 2 is really 1 fourth. And what happens to e and ln of e? They cancel. Just like before now. Same thing happens here. E to the ln cancels, leaving us with 1 fourth. And let's simplify this down if you have not already. So it is 1 half, and then you subtract a fourth from it. All right, gives you a fourth. OK, so we got a zero value here. Maybe a minimum, and maybe a maximum. Let's see what the next one gives you. So if I were to plug in a 1 into this function here, I would get this and this. This becomes 1 over e times 1 over e squared. All right, and punch this into the calculator, see what you get. Here's me punching it in as well. Let's see what the 83 would handle it. And I got a value of 0 0.23, I don't know, 3, I guess. I'll do it that way. So, actually, that did not give me an absolute max or an absolute min. The lowest point I have is, or actually the highest point I have, is given by ln of 2. Interesting. Lowest point is by 0. So here it is, how it is. Absolute. The value of 1 fourth, or absolute max of 1 fourth at x equals ln 2. Because 1 fourth technically is 0 0.25, right? Instead of 0 0.233 which we got on the calculator. All right, absolute minimum of 0 at x equals 0. All right.
uh, and then the graphical sky. There it is. Yeah, about 0.69, right? There, about right there is where your highest occurs. 0.69 is the absolute maximum. And your minimum compared to 1, which is right here. And then 0, which is right here. That would be the minimum. All right. And last one. This is a, what is it's a polynomial function of x squared minus 4 inside a radical function called 2 thirds. Interesting, it's kind of two things put together. All right, let's go for it here. So I think I can take the derivative right away. So we're going from negative 4 to 4. Okay, that's cool. So the derivative is. And this is a power rule here. So two thirds is the outside function. X squared minus four is the inside function. Then we're going to subtract. So two thirds minus one, or two thirds minus three thirds, and x and negative one third. Then the chain rule says I still have to take the derivative of the inside stuff, which is x squared minus four, which becomes two x. All right, simplifying this out a little further, it looks like two and two is four. So four x on top. And then we have ourselves a three in the bottom. And then we have the x squared minus four down to a positive one third instead. Okay. Once we've simplified, we set this guy equal to a zero. All right, so now the question becomes this. Is there ever a time the denominator will become zero? So is there ever a time we don't have a differentiable function? And absolutely, when x squared minus four is equal to zero, that's going to make it all things bad. And we get ourselves that answer if you get a two and negative two. So I got to check those points, two and a negative two. Something's happening there. There's either, let's see, there's either a maximum or a minimum or a plateau or a cusp or a corner or the derivative goes to infinity. There it is. There's our six choices. All right, so let's test each one of these here. So it looks like I have one, two, Oh, I haven't even solved for the derivative yet. Hold on, I still have to do that. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so let's do this here. So let's multiply both sides by the denominator. It gets us 4x equals 0 divided by 4x equals 0. Okay, so what are we testing? We're testing negative 4. We're testing a negative 2. We're testing 0. A positive two, and then a positive four. So all your residual for it if you can. And technically, what you want to do is you do want to have an exact answer for these, uh, just to put into your calculator, and that's it. Again, just to practice. This is a lot of practice of algebra as well. So if you do this, you should get. An answer of this right here. Square, so you can write it like that or you can write it like this. Like the cube root of 144. Plug in a negative 2, you get a 0. Plug in a 0, you get yourself this cube root of negative 4, which is cube root of 16. Plug in a positive 2, you get a 0. 
put in a positive four and you get this little guy, which becomes this little guy here. So Q root of 144. So let's see, what's our maximum values? Yeah, there it is. Maximum values are at square root of 144 at x equals negative four and four. And what's the Q root of 144 actually? All right, absolute minimum of zero at x equals All right, what does the graph of this look like? There it is. What is that like a W with a curvy middle, I guess? There. All right, so thank you so much watching this video. Hopefully it was informative and you can start on your chapter 4.1 homework at this time.